So here I am. Um, I'm going to build a slab teapot as advertised. Um, there's a lot of pieces involved. There's a whole process thing, but please feel free to ask questions while I'm working. And if I don't hear you, just like ask it louder and, and I'll get to it. So the main parts of a teapot are going to be the bottom, the sides, the top, the lid, the spout, and the lugs. And then there's little things that happen in between. And I made these slabs at home and they've gotten a little bit stiff. And one of the things you can do, clay tends to stiffen up no matter whether it's in a bag from, from a place that mixes your clay or if it sits around for a while or if you make a slab. And once it's stiff, you can kind of fix that by just waggling it around or throwing it down a little bit and it becomes more pliable again. You just have to break that surface tension that has developed. So I brought these, I made these slabs a couple days ago and because Oregon is not very dry, they're still very workable. Um, so this is, I do uh, try to make templates for the different pieces I'm going to need. It makes it so much simpler um, than trying to figure out what size of everything you need as you go. So this is the bottom. I'm just going to cut it. Um, one of the tools I really rely on are these little plastic scalpels. They, I, I think they're actually medical grade and you buy them like in a box of 10 or 20 and they're really cheap and all they Although eventually they get dull and you have to throw them away, they're. Excuse me, Potters. Uh, again, I just want to mention there is a wallet that has been lost. Thank you. And then um, I always work on a, something that I can move around so that I don't have to be handling the pot any more than I need to once it's done. And this is just a piece of interfacing that you can get at a fabric store because that keeps the clay from sticking to whatever it's on. So I've got a couple of different ways of moving things around and getting things not to stick. So um, another really important thing to do in slab work is to measure things. And so this is going to be the sides to this teapot. And the same thing, I need to um, loosen it up a bit. And I've pretty much measured, it's not going to be exact just yet, but this is about the size I need for my sides of my teapot. And yeah, please. Well, um, so the question was, do I let the slabs set for a while before I work on them? And the answer is it has a lot to do with the weather and it has a lot to do with what the consistency of the clay is before uh, when I roll them out. Because if they're too wet, they're just going to flop around and tear. Um, I mean, there are people that do work with very wet slabs. I just happen to not be one of those people. And so I like my stab slabs to stand up on their own so that I don't have to try to support them. So now I have something this size and it's because I've been messing with it, it's pretty flexible and I can put it right on top of the bottom I cut and as you can see it is in fact too big. So I want to cut this down so that it has only just a little bit of overlap uh, because I use I use this little tool a lot. It's it's you probably can't see them. It's got two little wires and they're in triangular shapes. And so if I cut around the edge of this bottom piece. It creates an angle.
And if I do the same on this one, I use the, sh the uh, longer angle because I want a, lot, a, a better overlap on this for a seam. And then this can interface with the bottom down here. So we do this thing called scoring and slipping when we put clay together. So I'm going to score. It's just a matter of making a lot of marks in here. People do what is called scoring and slipping. Slipping is when you add liquid clay on top of this and it helps two scored pieces to stick together. And I'm not a big fan of slip, so I just use I use um, gardening vinegar, and it's got 30% acid in it. It's like if you smell it, it makes you want to cry. But um, I just paint it on. And then I can take my upright piece, and because both sides are beveled, it makes a better join. Okay, and then these two pieces that have a long, you know, it's not a 45 degree, it's more like a 60 degree angle. I can do the same thing with them. And add the vinegar. So it makes a flat seam because of that, because of that angle and because of the overlap, I get a very flat seam. In fact, I could pick this up now and you can see how that fits together. And then if I paddle this, it really uh, kind of cements what's going on there. So there's still kind of a, um, an obvious join at the bottom. And in order to keep that from cracking and to make it look a lot nicer, although probably nobody will look inside here once this is done. Um, but I take small pieces of clay, make them into tiny coils like that, and then I just add them in here. and. Because all this clay is about the same wetness, I don't really need to slip these and score them. If I just smush them in here, they're going to smooth out that the seam between the bottom and the top. And I like to use these small pieces rather than a long coil because they're a lot easier to um, control. If you put a long coil in there and you start to smooth it around, it'll buckle or it'll do something that I don't want it to do. But these little ones are just a little piece of clay and they'll smooth out the entire inside. I don't know if you can see from there, but But now it's really smooth on the inside. If you can, I don't know if you can see the difference, but it's different. Take my word for it. Um, <clears throat> I had actually planned to texture this slab before I got started building this, but since I didn't, I'll just move on and do something different later. Um, so I don't want it to be just a straight sided cylinder, so I'm going to cut darts in the sides like this.
And before I make sure that those are all, before I really kind of glue them together with, with the vinegar, I can just kind of push them around and make sure that they are actually giving me the shape that I want and that they're fitting pretty well. And I can take more away so that it can fit flatter. And so when I'm done, I'll have an oval top that's smaller than the bottom. So I'm, then I'm going to score that and I'm going to paint that with vinegar. And then I can put those together. Oh, this gardening vinegar, I think you can get it in like any garden department, like at Fred Meyer's or at a nursery or pretty much anywhere. It's pretty normal stuff. Um, and then because I want this to sit, kind of have a nice contour, I'm going to try to shape it with my paddle a little bit. so that it doesn't look pointy and chopped up. So then I have my pot. It's pretty, um, it's pretty smooth on the inside and the outside, and it's ready for the top to go onto it. So And I always want my clay to be as flexible as it can be without being in danger of collapsing. So this will help it flex some more. So what I'm going to want is going to be smaller than the bottom, but it's a good place to start. You can see it's big, and I'm also going to want it to have a, a bit of a dome. So the first thing I'm going to do is start to trim away some of what looks pretty extra here. Okay. 
that's still a little bit big, but it's okay. Um, and then to get the dome, I'm just going to run this ball around on here a little bit. Usually I'll have a bigger piece of foam that will cradle this entire piece, but I left it at home. So today, I'm just using this sponge. So it's becoming a little rounder at the top. And then I want to bevel this edge again. So then I'm going to more scoring and more vinegar. And I'm going to let this part, which is already at an angle, just fit on top of here. Usually I'll work on two or three of these at a time, maybe four, and I'll, I'll, I'll make all my slabs and then I'll cut out as many pieces as I can cut before I start to work. And then I'll get to a point where I really can't work any longer on any of them and let them set for a while. The really cool thing about clay is that if you end up having to put pieces together that don't really have the same uh, amount of moisture, you can often just wrap the whole thing up for a day or so in plastic and the, the moisture content will equalize throughout the piece. And then it's a lot easier to continue working. And of course, in Oregon, sometimes you don't even have to cover them. You can just let them sit around for a while and, and that happens. So now I need to trim this top. So this is just a cheese cutter from a grocery store. And if I run it around the edge, Okay, so now I have the body and the top. And if I want to smooth this down a little, I can do that. And I can do that more later, um, just to finish it off. If there's little places that have little divots, I can add a little clay to make it nicer. You can use a little water, not much, just a little. So because I did not use a texture roller on this as I had planned to, I'm going to get just a little carving tool and um, do some carving on this. While I can just pick it up, it's all in one piece. It doesn't have anything coming off of it. It doesn't have anything that's going to get in the way. This was a fairly heavy wall. 
So I can just carve pretty deep. And I don't ever really draw on these before I start working on them. I just, I just carve. So for me, the, um, there are a couple of things about having texture on these pieces. Um, I work both uh, with cone six electric kills and with atmospheric firing with um, soda or wood. And my feeling about cone six electric is that if you don't have texture, you end up with a really boring surface because the texture will help the glaze to break, which means that the color will change. You'll have areas that are lighter, areas that are darker. Um, if you don't have any texture, you pretty much are consigned to a pretty flat color on, a, on an electric firing. And with the atmospheric firing, which is either wood or soda, the pots are very changed by how the flame hits them in the kill or the, um, the directionality uh, in a soda kill, the soda turns to vapor at a high temperature and it gets pushed through the kill by the flames and it hits directionally. And so every place it hits a mark, you'll see the effect of the flame and the salt on the, on the clay. Kind of like these. These are, these are um, this is wood fired, it might be wood salt fired, and this is um, soda fired. So you can see that you don't get a flat color at all on these. On this one, I believe there's wood ash that then uh, melted and it falls in and you just get a, a lot more uh, variation in color. And, and it shows what the interaction is with, with the actual firing atmosphere. I find that I can carve fairly deep into this wall, but what I have to be really careful about later and, and fix it if it's, if it's become a problem is where that join was between the top and the bottom. It's really easy to go through and leave a little hole, which obviously would be a really bad idea for a teapot. So I always wanna go back later and just check those joins and make sure that nothing has gone through. So that's it's pretty quick, but essentially the type of thing that I would want to be looking for. Okay, then I need some new pieces. I need to make a top and um, sort of a new thing I've decided is I need to give it a little bit of lift. So I haven't really done this before, but I think it'll be fine. So I have a bunch of these kinds of template things and I want one that will fit on the top of this with no problem and give me a little bit of lift. So Okay, so this piece is going to sit on top like that, but I'm gonna make sure that it's strong enough to hold the lid.
So what I really want is just a little ring that looks like that. I'm going to mark where it's going to go on here. I'm going to score the bottom of this little ring. And then I'm going to score that where it's going to sit on the pot. And add it on there. Like I said, there's a lot of pieces to a teapot. And in the end, they all have to work together, and it can be kind of tricky. Okay, so now I still have a closed form, and I'm going to make a hole in here now where the lid can fit when the lid is done. Okay, so that looks pretty clean, but there is this little seam inside where I put the top on, and that still has one of those slightly open seams. So I'm going to go back in, get my little pieces that I can fit to that join, and it just has to feel right. It's not really clearly something that you can look at while you're doing it. I guess if you were really good and had a dental mirror, maybe you could do that. But when somebody's putting their hand in here to clean a teapot, I don't want them to come up against a rough edge or a, a little shelf. And now, now it feels good in there. It's soft, it's clean, and nobody's going to be shocked when they go in there and say, well, how'd you make this thing? Okay. So the next thing is going to be the flange that fits inside of here. And for that, I really need to have clay that's wet. So... Doesn't need to be a lot of clay, just enough.
So the flange, for me, it's a piece that should be pretty thin because I don't want to be adding extra weight now to this pot. But I want it to be fairly deep so that it's not in danger of falling out when somebody's pouring tea. Somebody talking about drinking tea? I don't drink tea, so I like making teapots, but I actually don't drink tea. And this will fit in here pretty nicely. So I need to join this. I need to even it off just a bit. And then I need to make a very slightly larger than this lid. So I want my lid to just about match this rim so that it's not sticking out, so that it's not jogging in, so that it's really just exactly almost the same. I think I got it here. And then I want this to also have a similar shape. So that's a little small, and I'm just going to roll it a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. Usually these stretch when you give them the little rubber ball treatment, but this um, slab is a little bit firmer than normal. But that's, that's pretty close, and then I can trim that down to exactly fit when I'm ready. So, I really want to be sure that this part will stick together. So, I'm going to really try to mash it in a little bit.
And in a while, I can come back. This is kind of the quick version. Um, but I can come back and work on that when it's set up a little bit to be sure that those joins won't separate. Um, then, because I really want to be sure that it will not stick to the clay that's there, I can put a little piece of plastic in here. has to go down in there far enough that it doesn't interfere with that flange and smash it up. But I just want to be sure that this will come off again. Okay, and then that is going to need to have a little knob on it. So, I don't ever want to forget that everything is a little bit arched and I want I want that knob to fit right on the lid with the arch intact. And just gonna carve part of that out so that it'll match the bottom a little bit more. So again, it has to be scored. It needs the vinegar because without the vinegar, everything comes apart. Okay. okay. So the next thing this teapot probably needs is a spout. And to do the spout, I really need wet clay. So after this, you know, this is when uh, all of this clay is pretty much the same thickness and, and uh, moisture content. This is going to be wetter. And when I would be finished with this at home, then when everything's done, I would just wrap it up and let it sit for a couple of days so that that moisture equalizes out. So a teapot spout is a funny thing. It, um, it's a funny shape that you have to think about in three dimensions, even though you're cutting it out one dimensionally, two dimensionally. And to be really um, pliable, it needs to be fairly thin. This is pretty thin. I'm hoping that this clay is wet enough and we'll find out really soon. Um, oh, thanks for asking. This is hardy board. It's like a concrete board. And um, in my studio, the tables are all made of this. It doesn't wrinkle. It absorbs moisture. You can actually wet it down if your clay's a little bit stiff. So to make a spout, you have to think about that it's going to want to be small at the top and bigger at the bottom. 
and it's going to have to wrap. So this is kind of the shape I use for a spout. And I think it's a little, little dry, but I think it'll be okay. And I'm going to wrap it just around this little tool. One thing about um, a thrown, a lot of people throw their teapot spouts and if you th anything you throw on the wheel tends to get a bit of torque. And then the common knowledge is after you put your teapot spout on, it remembers how it got twisted and it twists back when it fires. So a lot of times a teapot spout is not straight. It's kind of wonky or twisted. If you hand build a spout, you don't have that problem because there's no memory to being twisted around. So I just want to thin this out and open it up a little bit. And figure out where it belongs on my teapot. So it's going to go on kind of like this. And I can refine the shape a little bit while it's here. I didn't put any holes in here, but that is the thing to do now. So I have um, a set of drill bits and I have a mark where I'm going to have my spout on here so I can just drill those holes right into the side of my pot. And then I, I just want to clean up so there's not a bunch of gunk in here that would either catch glaze or catch tea or just be kind of not very nice. None of this stuff is going to show, but you still want it to be right. So I'm going to score again. Score my spout.
Excuse me, Potters, it's time to sign in for your three o'clock worksheet, please. Thank you. So now, obviously, I've kind of messed up my carving, so I have to go back and fix that. So every decision that you make when you do this is important because everything will show in the end. And um, this is rough right now, but it's too wet to work with, so I have to come in later and clean this spout up a bit. It's just all part of what you just have to do. So this is okay for now. I'll come back in when it's just a little bit firmer and work on this contour and this join and this upper seam. And um, I want to put in a little steam hole for steam to come out of. So that's a little detail. My flange kind of came off of this. This is, I have to fix this.
And then the last piece that has to be done is the lugs um, for a handle. Depends on the weather. <laughs> it's, um, you know, in a, on a good day, it'll be a couple of hours. On a bad week, it'll be a couple of days or more. So, kind of, you can't, like, do it and then go on vacation. You have to stick around. Uh, although, in this weather, you can wrap it all up in plastic and go on vacation. And when you come back, you can still work on it. It's amazing what can happen. So um, I make these handles after the pots are fired, and I make them out of reed that I have in my studio. So I don't have to worry when I'm doing this about what the distance is between the lugs. If you get store-bought handles, I think you have to be more concerned with what's going to fit. But because I make these and, and they're on the pots and they don't move and they don't get detached... Um, and they don't fall over. They can just be whatever works here for these lugs. So I want um, to just soften all these little edges. And then I want to add just a little bit of something more so that the top isn't abandoned to the carving on the bottom.
And that's kind of, that's all there is.